here. Thank you very much. I forgot the imaginary unit. Times e, and here we will have minus 2 pi divided by n multiplied by m times j. Right? Now, why is this here true? Because uh, this is equal complex conjugate of cosine omega plus i sine omega, which is equal to cosine omega minus i sine omega. And this is easy to see that this is precisely e to the minus i omega, right? Because this is cosine of minus omega, which is the same as cosine omega, or cosine is even function, and uh, times plus i times sine of minus omega, which is minus i sine omega. Okay, and now I can simplify this uh, uh, by putting it together, and I get sum when i equals from 1 to n, and then e to the power i times uh, 2 pi uh, times, uh, times k minus m times j, right? Now, but what is this? Let's see. Let's Sorry? Oh, the n got forgotten. <laughs> Thank you very much. So now we have two cases, uh, right? Uh, so if uh, k is equal to m, then this sum is equal to what? What happens if k is equal to m? This is e to the power 0. What is e to the power 0? It's 1. And you have n of these, so this is equal just to m. So we just saw that uh, fk times fk is equal to n, which translates in the norm of fk, right? The other is equal to square root n, right? Because the norm is square root of a dot product of the vector by itself. Okay, so that's if k is equal to n. What happens if, uh, let me move to the other board so that I don't have anything to erase. What happens uh, if uh, k is not equal to n? If k is not equal to to m, if k is not equal to m, then uh, b k times b m is equal to the sum j goes from zero. From, sorry, from one to n, um, which is uh, I should have. Uh, G, 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 G. I messed it tiny little bit up, right? Uh, we should have indexed uh, uh, the coordinate. Well, it was, uh, yeah. Okay, let's slightly. <laughs> sorry about. Let's go <laughs> between. Uh, start indexing of coordinates from zero to n minus one. Uh, it also works with one, but it's. Uh, it's kind of a bit unusual, so let's just change it, uh, start the indexing uh, from zero. Okay, so this is equal sum. J is equal from zero to n minus one. And this I can write as follows. E to the i uh, times two pi divided by n times k minus m, and then 
this to the power j. And you can see this is simply a sum of a geometric progression. So this is equal sum j equals from 0 to n minus 1 q to j for q equals e to the i 2 pi over n times k minus n. So this sum is then equal, uh, well, how does it go? On top you have 1 minus q to the 1 power or larger, which is n, divided by 1 minus q, which is equal 1 minus, if I substitute this, is e to the i 2 pi divided by n times k minus m, and then to the power n divided by 1 minus e to the i 2 pi divided by n k minus m, right? But what is this guy? If I n can multiply this, so what is the, this cancels this, right? So this is equal 1 minus e to the i 2 pi uh, k minus m, right? But this is a perfect multiple of 2 pi, so this is equal to 1, right? Because only cosine 2 pi times integer is 1, and so this uh, 1 minus uh, uh, whatever is here, so this is 1 minus 1 divided by whatever is on the bottom, which is 0. So you see, it's, there is nothing to memorize. You just remember a simple fact that the Fourier basis, how is Fourier basis obtained? Fourier basis consists of vectors that are increasing all powers of the roots of unity, right? So first, as, uh, uh, right, you have um, yeah. I guess I could have okay. So, so you just arrange with all powers of the roots of unity, and you get the Fourier basis. So, so now. This is an orthonormal basis, thus we can write any vector x in the following form. Uh, it's x, oh, in order to make it orthonormal, which vectors should we choose? Uh, well, f vectors have norm n, so to make fk orthonormal, I have to divide fk with, uh, by what? square root n, right? So uh, we now consider slightly changed basis. Uh, so let pk be fk divided by square root n, right? So what is this? Well, this is the following 1 over square root n. And then here you will have uh, 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 omega n k to the power 0, uh, omega n k to the power 1, up to omega n k to the power n minus 1. Okay? Uh, uh, then this basis so phi k is orthonormal 
And what do we get now? Any vector x can be written in the form scalar product of x times phi 0 plus uh, times phi 0 plus x times phi 1 times phi 1 plus and so forth um, plus x times phi n times phi n. Let's compute what x times phi k is. So what is, um, what is x times phi k? Right, x times phi k is the sum j goes from 0 to n minus 1 of uh, xj times, uh, 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 what is uh, now uh, phi k? Uh, its coordinate is omega n, right, to the power k, and then we take uh, j coordinate, which means this, and then we have to conjugate it, uh, right? Because phi k is built from powers, k powers of omega n, uh, right? And j coordinate is uh, this to the power j. Uh, what is this equal to? This is sum j is equal from 0 to n minus 1 xj. And this is uh, um, e. Now, because of complex conjugate will be minus i. And then 2 pi kj divided by n. So k coordinate of x in this new basis is this. How do we call this, uh, the sequence of these sums? We had it in 3, 1, 2, 1. Look, how can we write this? Yes. Uh, don't we need to have a root n inside those sums? Oh yes, 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 yes. So here, because the where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Uh, oh, on top. <laughs> Thank you very much. I forgot that we have here. Uh, so let me put it in front. Here, where is it? It's here. Uh, it's uh, 1 over square root n, and then here it's also 1 over square root n. So what is this? Uh, let's write it in a slightly uh, different way. So how can I write this? So consider the polynomial uh, p of x is equal, uh, now I have, uh, let me call it p of y, is equal to um, x0 plus x1y plus, plus xny to the n minus 1. Then 
um, x times phi k is equal um, uh, maybe it's better if I put also the square root here. So this polynomial, 1 over square root n, and then this, then this is nothing but the value of the polynomial y at what point? And the point uh, omega n to the to power minus uh, k times so uh, to the power omega to the minus k right when you substitute that's exactly what you get how to recall the value of a polynomial whose coefficients are the coordinates of the vector when you evaluate it in powers of the roots of unity how do we call this? Huh? So uh, the sequence uh, p omega n uh, to 0, p omega n to minus 1, p omega n to minus n minus 1, is called the discrete Fourier transform of sequence of vector x. So what is the discrete Fourier transform of a sequence? It's nothing but the coordinates of that sequence, right? So uh, we call this, uh, so let me, uh, let me move over there. So uh, we call um, x times phi k is uh, usually denoted by x k with a little hat on top, right? So we got that x is equal x zero hat times phi zero by zero plus x1 hat uh, phi 1 plus plus uh, xn minus 1 hat uh, times phi n minus 1, right? Because each of these, uh, right, each of these, because of this property, right? This is just the product, right? This is nothing to but to say x times phi 0 times phi 0 plus x times phi 1, phi 1 plus, plus x times phi n minus 1 times phi n minus 1, right? Every vector is linear combination of any basis vectors with coordinates that are scalar products of the vector with the corresponding basis vectors. So the discrete Fourier transform, right, is nothing but the sequence of the coordinates in this quote-unquote strange basis, right? So, the, so there is nothing, vector remains the same, but instead of the basis uh, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, and so forth, you take the basis that uh, 
so that the coordinates are power, powers of powers of roots of unity, right? Now, why do we want to look at all at such a basis? Just bear with me, and then we will do mathematical simulations, and everything will be uh, even. Why would you represent uh, the basis in such a strange basis? The reason is because this representation has a physical interpretation. If you consider your vector <coughs> to be a vector of samples of the signal, it tells you that this signal can be seen as some of linear combination of samples of sine waves with increasing frequency. Right? So it, what the, the coefficients, uh, the uh, coordinates in these bases, uh, have physical significance because they <coughs> tell you which frequencies are present in your signal. Okay? In particular, <coughs> you hit a note on a piano, right? And you get, say, 256 samples of the sound. You do Fourier transform, you represent this sequence of samples in this basis. Only, uh, you will see, only the coordinate, only the, the only coordinate that will have a large modulus will be at the frequency of the tone, of the note. So you see, this basis is good when you are looking for periodicities. <coughs> for example, if you sample the temperature say, every hour for the entire year, and you take the Fourier transform, what do you think? How many spikes, how many coordinates that are large will you get? So you take, OK, let me, uh, let me do a little bit more. Uh, of, uh, let me write the whole thing in a slightly different way, <coughs> and then it will be much clearer. It is hard to overestimate the importance of this. You will see JPEG and MP3 all depend crucially of on precisely what we are doing now, and it's, if you want to do a multimedia, this can set, set you aside of the pack, right? So I suggest the following. Let's consider the following function of T. This function is uh, the following. It is... Uh, let me use the same notation as um, the um, so is uh, e to the uh, to the uh, i two pi divided by n. Um, times, so oh, let me call it like this. So this is SIK of T times K times T. What is this function? This is simply cosine uh, of uh, 2 pi divided by N times k times t, right, plus i sine 2 pi divided by n times k times t. So this is a pure harmonic oscillation, because both the real and the imaginary part are just 
essentially sine waves that are <coughs> out of phase for pi over 2, right? What is the frequency of this sine wave? This is the frequency, fk. And as k grows, so when k goes between 0 to n minus 1, you have a DC component because if uh, k is equal to 0, this is cosine 0, this is 1, so this is just identically 1. So notice uh, uh, SI0 of t is just identically equal to 1. We call it DC, direct current, right? As you increase the k, so the first one here will look like this. This is your cosine. The second one starts here, but it's twice as fast. So it completes two periods for the time of uh, uh, this one completes one. The next one will be even faster. So you see, these are simply harmonic oscillations of in, in steps of 2 pi over n, right? So what is then our vector phi k? Yeah? Our vector phi k is simply the set of samples S i k of 0, S i k of 1, up to S i k of n minus 1, divided by square root n. I guess I could have put in from here square root n, but that's uh, not important. So your basis is actually not artificial. It's not as weird as it looks the first time you see. It's actually the basis consists of sequences of samples of these pure harmonic oscillations. Right? Now, if I, so what does it mean if I represent x as a sum of xk hat times phi k? It means that this is the same as saying the following. That, uh, well, let's consider a function x of t that looks like this. Uh, it is a sum when j goes from 0 to n minus 1. Uh, x j hat uh, times s i j of t. Then, if I instantiate this, uh, for t, so uh, then uh, my vector x is simply x of 0 up to x of uh, n minus 1. So if I kind of extend what the objects are, right? Essentially, if you see vector x as a sequence of samples of a continuum time, uh, continuum time uh, 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 function, right? Then these simply, the Fourier, discrete Fourier coefficients simply tell you how much of each harmonic oscillation is present in xt. Right? And uh, consequently, if you play a key on a piano, and you sample the sound, say, and take 256 samples. Uh, then the only coefficient uh, that will be large uh, that you will get here is the coefficient at the frequency of the tone. 
right? Because that's precisely what this tells you, right? These are harmonic oscillations at increasing. So your, uh, if your frequency are normalized to be between minus pi and pi, and you divide it into n pieces, right? Then uh, the spike will occur. Actually, there will be two spikes. One will be here, and one will be here uh, for the negative frequencies. Because, but that's you will see this later. But the point is this: the basis is so important because when you represent your vector in this on the first side strange basis, the coefficients tell you something. The coordinates tell you how much of each frequency is present in your signal. Now, if you sample the temperature every hour over the entire year, what do you think? How many sine waves, how many peaks will you get? What do you think? She got it. She said it was two. Like two. Like Very good. Hour. Why only two? Tell us. Uh, once the, the frequency of, like, you have over an entire year, you'll have a sine wave. For each day, you'll have a sine wave. So you get the frequency of both. That's exactly right. First periodicity is over during the day. So it will be one frequency that corresponds to, uh, to daily change. The second frequency that will have that you will see is the seasonal frequency with the, right with a complete period uh, of uh, one year. So there will be only two spikes. If you do count on sun, uh, how do you call it? Sun sunspots, right? How many? Where is? Where are the peaks? With what periodicity? Thirteen years. Yep, I think that's right. Uh, so there is, the sunspots are periodic with, uh, what's it, 13 you said? 13 years? 13 yeah. or 13? 13. 13, I thought it was 13. 13, I think it's 13 is right. So you see, the importance of the basis is that it gives you important information. It tells you for each of these harmonic oscillations, uh, with what frequencies they are present. Uh, with, sorry, with what amplitudes they are present. Yes? Uh, so just in terms of n, so if n is too small, is it possible that some uh, frequencies are not captured? Yes. So <coughs> that's an important thing called, <coughs> called aliasing. You see, the trouble is uh, that if two frequencies are kind of spaced it can happen that a frequency that is, um, let me show you, say, uh, this, uh, right, they can happen to intersect uh, the low frequency, ah, I messed it up here, this should go like this and then go this way. You see, uh, uh, sometimes high frequencies can be construed as low frequencies because of just you didn't sample fast enough. Huh? So you, to make sure that no frequency will be missed, right? you should make sure, as we will see, that you sample at a rate that is twice the largest frequency present in the signal. This avoids uh, to avoid aliasing. So gee, um, let, me, uh, let me just very briefly. I urge you to read the notes, but um, let me 
let's see if we can JPEG. So look, th that's the point what I want to, um, I could teach you about JPEG as if you were monkeys. Uh. <laughs> uh, just gives you, give you a recipe and uh, where is the uh, full screen, here it is. Right? Give you the formulas and say this is JPEG. And Embarrassingly enough, this is how they teach JPEG in, uh, <coughs> in signal processing textbook, and it's just appalling, right? <coughs> JPEG is one of the absolutely brilliant examples of great engineering. What is engineering? Engineering is making models, approximate models of reality, and you want this approximation to be good enough for your purposes. So, for example, if you are in compressing an image, you want that the image that you obtain after the compression looks to you as good as the original or, or almost as good as the original. But on the other hand, you don't want this model to be super precise because it will be computationally intractable, right? So JPEG is a great example how to strike a balance between accuracy of the model and usefulness of the model. OK. So here is a signal, right? And the signal is very simple. It has only cosine, uh, one cosine plus another cosine with slightly higher 